Hey everyone, how are you guys tonight? You're getting crazy hair, Jody. This is impressive. Crazy hair, Jody McKenna, coming to you for Brian's call tonight. So I was outside. Um, I'm just gonna give you a little chitty chat while while we wait for a few more people to join us. I was outside today um, cleaning all things on the driveway where chickens and ducks have roamed and had a lot of fun in our driveway. And so you couldn't even tell we had concrete on our driveway. So I've been wearing my overalls and moving hay around, helping clean tractors and all whatnot. So crazy hair lady. Anyways, we're super glad to have you join us tonight. Um, you know, this class <laughs> could be called the science of essential oils or how and why oils work. Um, I'm really excited uh, just for Brian to share this with you because um, Brian was once upon a time a huge skeptic. Like there, there were times where he'd be like, sure they work. And then there was the one time where he watched us use oils quite a bit. And then um, he, he was feeling a little nauseous. And he said, do you have something that'll help me? And so I, of course, took the high road and I did not say, don't you so? Uh, so I said, well, sure, try this peppermint on your belly. And he's like, don't, don't I need to just even, like, how is it going to help you just putting on my belly? And I was like, trust me, just put it on your belly. And so he did. And guess what? He wasn't nauseous anymore. And he, I remember just the, the confounded look on his face because he put it on his belly. He didn't take it and ingest the oil, which you can, but he didn't. And just rubbing it on his belly made the nauseousness go away. And so like, it was just like, how does that work? And I think that really launched kind of Brian's discovery of really trying to figure out how and why essential oils work and you know being an engineer and then pursuing his master's and stuff like that he's always he always wants to know the why he always wants to know how this works with this and why does that do that and he's taught that to all of our kids and so in order I think for him like he would use the oils but he really wanted to know what makes them tick, like what makes them unique and why do say young living oils work, but we could try another brand and they don't work. Why is that? What makes it unique about young living? So I'm really excited for that. Um, some housekeeping, if this is your first time on Zoom, um, is that if you're on your um, computer, um, then you're gonna see a bunch of bottoms bunch of buttons, not like buttons that you can touch unless it's touch screens computer. Um, but there's a little chat feature there. And so when you have questions, go ahead and open up that chat box and type your question there. Also, like if Brian's doing something great, you can use the little high five that um, there's like little hand signals that you can do to participate. Um, also, even have dialogue going during uh, while Brian's sharing and um, that's just always really encouraging um, just to see even community happening and conversation happening. So if Brian says something and, and someone's like, I, I've never used um, this oil or I don't understand that, type that and you never know. Someone who um, is an avid oiler might just like reply back while he's even um, sharing about how essential oils work, the science behind it. Um, and then if you're on your phone, there's three dots at the bottom right of your phone and you can click on those and those will have the chat feature on there also. Um, it's great that so many of you have your video on. I know that um, really helps whoever's presenting like be able to may really figure out like how people are understanding and things like that. So I know that helps Brian out a lot. And um, I think without further ado, um, we will, uh, I'll hand it over to Brian and then afterwards we will open it up to questions and, um, yes, we are recording if for some reason you have to go put kids to bed or the dog needs let out or something like that. 
but it's always best to catch it live. All right, crazy hair lady, turning it over to my fabulous, smart, sciencey husband. Okay, well, thank you so much for that intro, crazy hair lady. Um, and I think you, I feel like you just gave away about 90% of the content I had in my presentation talking about that story. So hopefully I've got enough left in reserves here after you, after you shared that story about my aha, aha moment that people will still learn something here tonight from me because they am sure they've already learned from crazy hair lady. So tonight we are going to be talking about the science of essential oils. And if that excites you, Great. We've got some exciting science. I happen to think that science is exciting and really interesting. And so if you're one of those people, then great. We've got some great science. If the science of essential oils scares you a little bit, then just hang on because it's all going to be at a, at a level that's understanding, right? The word science may seem overwhelming to you at first, but it's actually, um, it doesn't need to be right. We're going to demystify a lot of the science. And what I, what I want you to walk away with tonight is to know that that science, the science of essential oils, that there is a, that's a vital part of the therapeutic benefit that you get out of your essential oils. That there it isn't just all hooey. It isn't just all in your brain. That there is real science to back up how and why the essential oils work. And I want you to know more about how that how they work and why they work, so that you can be more empowered to make better decisions about your own health using essential oils um, as, as, a, uh, as a mechanism to do that. So that's that's the goal for tonight is for you guys to, to take, get some takeaways that you can actually put into practice and not just listen to this and think, hmm, that was really interesting, but I'll forget everything he said because it was too technical and too sciencey. So I'm going to try and make it applicable and stuff that you can actually walk away with and put into practice. So my first question though is for all of you, why are you here tonight? Because I find that most people who join a class about the science of essential oils fall into one of three camps, right? So either you're here because you're the skeptic, you just, you're like, mm, I think it's all hooey, but somebody made me come to this class. Somebody, uh, you know, challenged me to watch it. And I'm just going to see whether there's anything legitimate here. I'll bet there's no real science. And so I'm a skeptic. I'm just on here just to disprove everything this guy says. If that's you, then great. I welcome you because I think you'll learn something and I think you'll have some great takeaways from this. Maybe that you're in the next category though, and that's that you're curious. So maybe you don't know much about essential oils, but maybe you've had a, a really interesting experience with them that you can't quite explain. So you're really curious. You know that they work. You've seen them work for other people. You maybe you had them work for yourself, but you don't have any idea as to why. Like, tell me why this oil had this incredible benefit or impact on me. And that's where I was like, after I had that peppermint experience that Jody talked about was at that point I was curious. I'm like, okay, that worked really well, but I can't really explain how and why that worked. So I'm curious, but I'm not quite at that, at this next category. And all of us may fall somewhere in between some of these, but I'm the, for the purposes of simplicity, the next category I'm going to call is the know-it-all, right? Maybe you already really know a lot about essential oils, but you're just like, I just can't learn enough. I've already been to a lot of these classes and I've already learned a ton, but I want to know more. And I especially want to be able to explain and share with other people how and why those work. And I know they work and I even know what oil to use in most situations, but I want to take it up one more level and actually be able to explain to somebody a little bit about the how and why they work. So no matter what category you're in, whether you're the know-it-all or whether you're curious or whether you're a skeptic, I hope that there's something here for you tonight where you can take away some really good uh, uh, practical things that you can that you can start using in order to get more benefit out of the oils and in order for you to feel like you're empowered to make better decisions about them. So we're going to get into some of the science. We're going to get into some of the research. Um, a lot of people out there. Um, the question I often get is they think essential oils are just a fad, right? Well, is there really any any true health benefits to them or is it just a, fa a phase that we're going through? And is there really any truth or actual science behind them? And many of us have probably encountered somebody like that. Many of us maybe have even been that person, that unbeliever who is that skeptic. Um, but what I, the, what I have found is that the more I have dug in, the more I have read books and, and researched, and the more I've learned about the science and the biology and the chemistry behind essential oils, 
and how they interact and support our body systems that the more confident I get in, in using them and the more confident I get in sharing them with other people. And that's a big goal. I want you to feel comfortable using them. I want you to feel comfortable sharing them with other people because you know that you've got the science to support how and why they work. And so that's really uh, what I want you to get out of all this research we've done. Now, what are my qualifications to teach a class about the science of essential oils? Jody touched on it a little bit. Uh, I am not a scientist, so I, I do um, I, I, I do give some pause to the fact that I'm teaching a class on science. However, I am an engineer. I have a professional engineering license, and there's a whole lot of science that goes into engineering. In fact, I, we always, as engineers, we always said the difference is that scientists just like to study things. Engineers actually like to use what they study and figure out how to actually make things happen and get things done with that. So I love science. I've been a big student of science my whole life. And so when we started getting into essential oils, as Jody pointed out, I was quick to start digging in and researching and reading books. And so that's where a lot of my science knowledge about essential oils comes from is just my own self-study. I don't have any kind of advanced degrees in essential oils or in chemistry. Uh, my background is in civil engineering. I just use that 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 uh, that thirst for knowledge and for science and truth and understanding, I've just used that to fuel me in terms of doing the research on this myself. So with that, now that we understand where we're going tonight and what our goal is, let's dig in and talk about the first big question. And that is, let's, what is the definition for essential oil? What is an essential oil even uh, described as and defined as. So before we can really understand something and, and start answering those big questions about how and why it works, we have to know what it is and be able to define it. So let's agree on a good working definition of what an essential oil is before we go any further. And I'm going to define essential oils as the liquid compounds found in flowers, trees, leaves, roots, stems, fruit, and bushes of plants. And those, those essential oils, those compounds that come out of the the plants are typically extracted through a distillation or a cold pressing process. And each essential oil that comes out of that plant contains literally, in some cases, hundreds, sometimes thousands of different constituents, which make up the very diverse benefits and effects that you get out of essential oils. So constituents is a big word, maybe, maybe not something that you're comfortable with and understand and use in your everyday vernacular. That's okay. We're going to take a deep dive into constituents tonight and talk about what those are and what it means that the oil is made up of all these different constituents or compounds that make up one particular oil. Uh, but the, the important thing to remember off the bat with this is that because of the way that these are extracted, no two oils are ever going to be alike, right? Even from one distillation to another of a particular plant, even the same plant, you're not going to get exactly the same oil every time. You'll get some that, that are very similar and that have a lot of the same properties, but they won't always be exactly the same. Going a little further on the definition, the important thing to remember about essential oils and that they're these distilled compounds is that that means because of the fact that they're distilled, it means that they are highly concentrated. It's, they're a very concentrated form of the source plant where they come from typically on the range of being 100 to 10,000 times more concentrated than the herb itself and the plant it comes from. And essential oils, another thing about them in terms of definition, they are extremely volatile. Now, when I say volatile, I'm talking about in the chemical sense. I don't mean volatile in the sense that they're going to, what, what most people assume the definition of volatile is, that it means it's going to explode, that it you know, that a volatile person is somebody who's ready to explode, right? Well, in this, in the sense, in the true chemical sense, volatile just means that it readily evaporates. They're very, very small molecules that make up essential oils and therefore they evaporate very quickly. And so that's the primary difference, this volatility of essential oils, the primary difference between essential oils that come from plants and fatty oils that also can come from plants. So fatty oils would be oils like coconut and olive oil. Those are fatty oils. They're very large molecules. They don't evaporate easily, so they're not volatile, whereas essential oils very, very small molecules, which makes them evaporate very easily, which makes them extremely volatile. Um, so that's a good definition, some, some key points there about understanding what an essential oil is. It's distilled from plants. It's extremely concentrated, 100 to 10,000 times more concentrated than the herb itself. And it's very volatile. It evaporates very quickly because of how small 
the molecules are that make it up. So let's talk about the essential oils and why they would come out of a plant, right? What is the purpose for a plant of having an essential oil? Um, the plants produce essential oils for a number of reasons. Essential oils are, are basically though, they are a form of the plant's survival and defense mechanism. So it is thought that essential oils are used within the plant to do one of three primary roles. Either the essential oil is meant to attract, in other words, it might be used for to, to attract um, bees and other organisms that could be used to cross pollinate uh, that plant with, with other uh, plants of its species. Um, it may be that it's used as a, some type of chemical messenger to attract. Um, the next category would be to defend. Uh, plants may be able to use essential oils to, to, to repel certain pests. Uh, so an essential, a plant that has a really strong odor may protect it and repel insects and other pests that may uh, threaten the survival of that plant. And then the last thing is to repair. The plant's essential oils are help, used to help regenerate and heal the plant itself. And oftentimes the benefit that we see out of um, the, the function that an essential oil plays in the, inside the plant is exactly the same as what the benefit we may get with it when we use it on ourselves, right? It may be something that's, that helps us with our chemical messenger system in our body, what we refer to as our endocrine system. It could be something that helps to repel insects from us, right? You make it uh, insect repellents out of essential oils, or it might be something that's used to help heal and regenerate within our own body. So those are the three primary reasons why a plant has essential oils and why they would uh, why they would have those essential oils in the plant in the first place. Now let's talk about how those we get those essential oils out of the plant. And we talked earlier about how typically oils are extracted through either a steam distillation process or through a cold pressing process. We're going to take a look here at the steam distillation process. And I'm going to blow this up to the full screen there just so you can see that a little better. Um, and if you can't uh, see some of these, if the text on these is too small and you're looking at the presentation here in gallery view, in other words, you can see everybody and you can go to the top of the screen and switch your view from what they call the gallery view where you're seeing everybody and you can switch that to speaker view. And then that's going to give you a, a, make it so that I fill up your whole screen. You'll be able to see the slides a little bit better, but this one's got some small fonts. So I'm going to uh, zoom in on this while we're talking about this slide. So this is a, a very basic depiction of how oils are just extracted through this steam distillation process. And the first step here is, is step number one, water is heated by creating and creates steam. So they put some kind of heat source under that, the water boils and then evaporates into steam and that steam then rises up in step two there, the steam passes through the plant matter and it, it pulls out the essential oils. It basically dissolves the essential oils out of the plant into the steam and then the combination of the oil from the plants is with the steam rises up into uh, the, what we refer to as the gooseneck at the top. And it goes through that tube at the top. And then it, that tube is, is channeled to the condenser. And the condenser is a system where it's cooled. And so as it cools, those, uh, the, the steam molecules and the essential oil molecules that are in gas form or vapor form at this point are condensed by cooling them down, they then become, go back to a liquid state. And so the condenser in step four there cools the, the steam and uh, essential oil off, and then it channels that to the separator in step five. And the separator, because of the different densities of the water that comes from the steam and the essential oil that comes from the oil vapor, uh, you can use a, basically just a chamber where those two are separated because the oil will rise to the top. It's less dense than the water and the water sinks to the bottom. And the oil sits on top. And so from the top, then you extract that and that's where you get your essential oil that goes right in your bottle. That, um, and on the bottom is the leftover water. Now there's still a, a fair amount of essential oil in that water that comes out below. And so that's what we're, is referred to as the floral water. And Young Living is, whenever possible, uses that floral water, again, for other purposes. Sometimes it's used in beauty and home products that they sell. In some cases, they use it to put it back on the, the crops and on the field, either as an insect repellent um, or, uh, or uh, as fertilizer and that, those kinds of things. So that they try it as best as possible to use all of the, the, the that, that comes off of there, both the floral water and the oil. But the, what you're buying when you buy a bottle of oil is just that top part the essential oil that separates out. 
All right, so here's a look at what this looks like in real life. This is a picture Jody and I took at the uh, Young Living Distillery in Northern British Columbia, Canada. This is the Northern Lights Farm. This is where we get our black spruce uh, oil. And you can see there the size of these uh, uh, cookers that, that extract the essential oil. So you're looking at um, five of those lined up across there. Um, and what these are basically is giant pressure cookers, right? So in a minute here, I'm going to show you the bottom of them, but I just wanted you to get a, a scale for how big these are. And again, this is just the distillery. The only thing they distill here at this distillery is Northern Lights Black Spruce. Um, you can see the mulch pile in the background there. So they actually cut the trees down. The trees are typically taken from where they're clearing trees to do farming in the area. And so Young Living um, will, will acquire those, uh, those trees. They chip those up when farmers in the area are clearing their, their land uh, of the trees in order to grow uh, crops, Young Living. So it's actually a waste product for the local people there. They take those, uh, those trees, they chip them up into a mulch, and then they put the mulch inside each of these cooker vats and then heat it up with water, heat the water up below it. And so this is a look, if you go down the stairs to the left there and see the bottom of these containers, uh, this is how much of them sticks out below. And you can see underneath there is the, the heating mechanisms, um, which is in, the, in this case is in the form of natural gas that's used to heat those up. And, and so the lower portion of this is all water that's used, the natural gas heats up that water and that steam then passes through the plant material. Um, and so this is on this lower level here, this is also where the condensers and the separators are. Um, but you, again, I'm showing you these just so you get a feel for like this, the magnitude of how large these facilities are. And again, this is just the distillery to distill uh, Northern Lights Black Spruce. Young Levy has distilleries like this all over the world. So they, whenever possible, they put a distillery as close to where they harvest the plants as possible. So there's distilleries in Utah where they're headquartered, there's distilleries and farms in Idaho and Washington, there's distilleries and farms in Hawaii and in Ecuador and around the world, there's, there's farms and distilleries based on where the best growing climate is for the plants. But because most of these plants don't transport well after they're harvested, they have to distill them right there on site. And so you'll find distilleries similar to this at almost every Young Living Farm around the world. And then this is a, a close up look. This is the separator with, you've got the tanks in the background there and this is the separator. So that whole beautiful yellow uh, liquid there, all of that is Northern Lights Black Spruce. And then everything below that in the, in the container below is the water that comes off that floral water. And so they would just then skim off this top of this. Um, and that's what, where you would get your oil that they would put first in barrels. And then those barrels get shipped back to uh, to a bottling center in Utah and from the from those barrels and they put that into the individual size bottles that you're used to buying. All right, so that's it for the distilling process. Let's talk about a little bit about constituents. I mentioned that word earlier about constituents. And so now we're going to take a little bit deeper look at what constituents are. Basically, the definition for a constituent is that it's a chemical compound found in essential oils. And so essential oils, as I mentioned earlier, are made up of hundreds of different constituents. And all those different constituents work together. They work together synergistically so that one amplifies the benefit. One, the benefit of one compound amplifies the benefit of another compound. Um, and so essential oils, just like any organic substance, any, any natural substance, are made up primarily of what are re referred to as hydrocarbon molecules. So the building blocks at the atomic level of an essential oil molecule are essentially hydrogen and carbon atoms, sometimes oxygen atoms added in, uh, sometimes other atoms, but the very basic building blocks, what constitutes uh, the most basic element of an essential oil molecule is hydrogen and carbon atoms combined together into these hydrocarbon molecules. So a single essential oil, like I said, can have hundreds of these constituents of these different hydrocarbon molecules in it but all of them use that same basic uh, hydrocarbon molecular building block. And we call that building block, the basic most uh, elementary form of that hydrocarbon molecule is called an isoprene unit. And so we can go into a whole, we could go into a whole class on isoprene units, but the important takeaway for you is that an isoprene unit, and we're gonna talk more about this, an isoprene unit is one that has five carbon atoms in it. And we're gonna see how that's relevant in a little bit, but in terms of of how large these molecules are, they have the, the basic building block of the isoprene unit 
has five carbon atoms in it, okay? And so these are small molecules. Atom, carbon atoms are very, very small. When you compare this to a, like the size of a human cell, uh, literally, if there, you could fit thousands of these essential oil hydrocarbon molecules inside one of our human cells. So much, much smaller. But because they use this common building block, all essential oil constituents can be put into some different groupings based upon these subtle changes in their molecular structure. And so that's what we're going to look at is the very basic categories of what these constituents are. Now, there's a whole a lot of ways that we could categorize these. There, there's a category of monoterpenes and a category of oxygenated terpenes and sesquiterpenes. There's alcohols and ketones and phenols and acids and esters. All of these are just different ways to label and categorize the, the, the molecular categories. Um, and so they refer to these as constituent categories. And so rather than trying to figure out the exact constituent that comes in an essential oil, Sometimes we do want to get down to that level of detail, but for this class, what we're going to focus on not is on the identifying the exact specific molecule in an essential oil, but we're going to talk about what constituent category primarily makes up this essential oil. And so uh, based on these constituent categories, what we're going to find is they have very similar molecular structures within those categories. And therefore they tend to have very similar fragrances and they have very similar ways that they support our bodies when they fall into those, these same uh, constituent categories. And so the categories labels all refer to this molecular structure. And we're going to look a little closer though at, at not all of these because that would be overwhelming. We don't have time to go through all the different categories. But what I want to focus on is those top three that are in red there. That's the monoterpenes, the oxygenated monoterpenes, and the sesquiterpenes. And so we're going to take a, a little bit closer look at what each of those three, because those are uh, the three main ones that make up the, uh, the bulk of essential oil constituent categories are these monoterpenes, oxygenated monoterpenes, and sesquiterpenes. Now, I mentioned earlier that the isoprene molecule is the basic building block, and that consists of five carbon atoms. Um, and when we put those two building blocks together, and what we, what we refer to as two isoprenes, we get what we call a terpene or a monoterpene. So this category consists of molecules that have one grouping, one mono, that's why it's called a mono, one mono grouping of these 10 carbon atoms. That's the monoterpene category. If you add an oxygen atom or two on top of that, in addition to those 10 carbon atoms and the monoterpenes, then you get what's called an oxygenated monoterpene. And then if you go to a little bit bigger molecule and you go with the sesquiterpene, sesqui meaning one and a half, right? Like a sesquicentennial is a 150 year anniversary. So a sesquiterpene, is a one and a half terpene. So that's, in that case, it's a terpene, that monoterpene is a 10 carbon atom molecule. Then the sesquiterpenes that we're gonna look at is gonna be 15 carbon atoms total in that molecule. And the most obvious chemical distinction between these categories, and the easiest way to look, to take a look at these in a lab and distinguish between these different categories of monoterpenes, oxygenated terpene, monoterpenes, and sesquiterpenes, is something that we refer to as a molecular weight, which is essentially just the size of the atom multiplied by how many of them there are. And so what we'll find is that we have ways in the lab to measure the molecular weight of the different compounds in an essential oil. And from that, we can break them up into these, uh, into these constituent categories of monoterpenes, oxygenated monoterpenes, and sesquiterpenes. So monoterpenes tend to be the lightest of all these uh, constituent categories. Oxygenated terpenes are the middle weights and the sesquiterpenes are the heaviest of this. So what's a good way to remember this? Well, a good way to, to think of this is that essential oils and all these different constituent categories essentially act and work together like a symphony of individual instruments. And the categories are the different instrument types. So the, I like to equate this to that the monoterpenes, these are the really small light aromas uh, and so these are the comparable of the woodwinds, right? These are like the flutes and the clarinets and the really high light sounding instruments. The oxygenated monoterpenes, these are more like the mid range instruments. So these would be like your, um, like your violins and your, your mid range string instruments. And then the sesquiterpenes are the really, really heavy molecules. They move much slower. They have a lower note to them when you smell them. So the, the sesquiterpenes are the equivalent of your tubas and your cellos in the symphony. 
And so each oil has a very unique mixture of these constituent categories. Not every oil has every category. Some have multiple categories. Some might only uh, have a monoterpene uh, assortment in them. But when we start blending different essential oil singles together, we typically start getting notes from all of these, these categories, the monoterpenes to the sesquiterpenes, which results in, this, in, the, in the aromas that we experience being like a symphony because we'll pick up some notes like, wow, I smell something flowery and sweet there, but then I also smell something woodsy. And so we might use those words to describe what we're smelling, right? Like woodsy or, or light and flowery. And, and so we're gonna talk about how you can use that, that sense of smell that you've already developed to distinguish between some of those different smells to identify whether those are monoterpenes, oxygenated monoterpenes or sesquiterpenes. And stay with me because I'm not even gonna explain why all this even matters. So here's another way to look at it graphically is that monoterpenes, these are really, really light molecules, right? These are our, our woodwinds, our flutes. And so the monoterpenes tend to diffuse and spread more quickly and they evaporate more readily. These are the most volatile of the essential oil constituent categories would be your monoterpenes. So a monoterpene, when you smell that, that's going to be one that, that immediately hits you and is, is really strong right when you put it on your skin. But then maybe after five or 10 minutes of it being on your skin, you don't smell anything. If that's the case, you're probably dealing with a monoterpene. Whereas the oxygenated monoterpenes tend to spread a little bit more slowly than those monoterpenes. And so these molecules may linger in the room, they may linger on, uh, on surfaces and, and on your skin a little bit longer. Um, and then uh, on the, all the way on the right side, there are your sesquiterpene molecules, which tend to linger uh, very long. They may not evaporate quickly at all. The molecules spread much more slowly than the monoterpenes and the oxygenated monoterpenes. And those molecules will remain on the surface for a long time. So if you put an oil with heavy sesquiterpenes on, you may not smell much of it at all at first, but an hour later, you're gonna if that aroma is still going to be present, although it's subtle that entire time, you'll smell much more of that sesquiterpene over the long haul. All right, so how do we figure any of this out? How do we even understand and, and how can we visualize and see what constituent categories are in a particular essential oil? Well, as I said earlier, it's the, the, it's the molecular weight of each of these categories that really helps us distinguish between these. And the best way to tell and determine the molecular weight of different compounds within an essential oil is to use what's called gas chromatography mass spectrometry. And so this is an instrument. This is actually at that same farm at Northern Lights Farm. I'm going to go ahead and blow that up so you can take a little bit closer look at that. So this is the instrument that's used to determine the molecular weight of uh, the different compounds that are within an essential oil uh, blend or single. And so the, this is a way for them to measure the constituents that are in the essential oil. And so what they do is that the oil is put into this machine and then the readout comes out on the left. And so what, you, what happens in that machine is that the oil is actually ignited and, it, and it's burned. And from that burning, that causes it to evaporate. And there is a long coil of copper wire inside that machine. And it measures how long it takes for the different molecular weight compounds to travel through that coil. And so the coil is measured by the computer to determine the quantity of each essential oil constituent that's in there. And they do that based on the lighter molecules are gonna move through that coil much faster and the heavier molecules are gonna take much longer to get through that. And then what you end up with is being able to turn that into a chart that looks something like this. And so on the bottom there, across that bottom axis is showing uh, the travel time that it took that particular compound. And so this is a, 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 a graph of an of a essential oil. And as you can see there, it's showing the ranges. So everything over to the left is really light molecular weights. Those are the monoterpenes on the left. In the middle is our mid-range uh, instruments, our mid-range uh, molecule molecular weights. So those are the oxygenated monoterpenes. And then all the way out to the right are the sesquiterpenes. And so in this particular oil, it's got a little bit of a blend of everything. It's got some monoterpenes, a little bit of oxygenated monoterpenes, and, and even a few uh, sesquiterpenes. So the, the, in terms of the height of each of those spikes there and showing how high up that goes, that shows you the quantity of that particular uh, oil. So it, as it's measuring travel time, it measures how much passes by in that particular travel time. And it gives you the quantity of each 
one of those constituent categories. And so we can use these, uh, these gas chromatography printouts, one, to determine what the constituent makeup is, but we can also use it to identify when something is wrong. So perhaps uh, with, with a, a, a essential oil uh, that's been contaminated with something, this would show up immediately if you, if you compared this profile to what the oil typically looks like, you're gonna have a spike at a different place on this gas chromatography output. And that's gonna be a red flag that there is some kind of contaminant in the essential oil. Young Living does these gas chromatography tests on every single batch of oil that they distill in order to make sure that there's no contamination, there's no uh, nothing that made it into the oil that shouldn't be there. This is a great way to flag and catch anything that isn't supposed to be there. It's also though a great way if, if Young Living is uh, working with a partner farm and Young Living isn't actually the one doing the distilling, they may be there on site periodically to inspect the distillation, uh, but they're not there the whole time. They don't know that Young Living does have to contract with some farms and some distilleries in order to meet the supply that's needed. But they have really stringent standards on the front end of that in terms of laying out all the methods for how they produce that oil. And then on the back end of it, they go through and test every single batch of oil that comes from that, uh, uh, that partner farm and they compare the, the gas chromatography output for that uh, distillation to what Young Living Library says it should look like. And they can immediately tell whether that oil has been altered in any way or whether the oil uh, has any potential contaminants in it and can send it back and reject it if it doesn't meet all of Young Living's standards. So let's talk now a little bit more about what each of these categories mean. So we talked about the monoterpenes as I told you earlier to remember, the important thing to remember here is when we say mono, it's, it's one grouping. And so it's this 10 carbon atom grouping, 10 carbon atoms along with some hydrogen and other atoms in it. But the 10 carbon atoms are what gives it its molecular weight. So when we think of monoterpenes, a lot of people like to think of these in terms of how they work at our cellular level. These are the organizers and the peacemakers. These help, uh, help to put everything else in its place and help the, the cell to uh, to, to stabilize and to be at peace. These oils in this monoterpene class tend to have a very, very stimulating effect. These are the ones that, like I said earlier, that you'll smell the, the moment you open the bottle, you smell the monoterpene notes. Uh, most of these um, would be in the, from coming from plants that are in the citrus category or a lot of the, some, uh, some flowery oils uh, fall into this monoterpene category. So remember that these like our flutes and woodwinds in our, in our symphony of oils. So now I wanna see what you guys think. Based upon that information, what would be some oils that you would expect to be in this monoterpene category? Go ahead and throw those in the chat. What your ideas for what those would be? I feel like this should be like a family feud show because I can't list them all, but I'm gonna list a few and I just wanna see uh, how much you guys are, are uh, connecting the dots on this in terms of what those can be. So give you a chance to think about that, the monoterpenes. All right, here we go. These are some monoterpenes. Like I said, these aren't all monoterpenes, but these are some of the really well-known ones. Sacred frankincense, really, really light aroma, right? That, that hits you immediately as soon as you open the bottle. Tea tree, of course, we've all opened a bottle of tea tree and put it too close to our nose before we, and then taken a really deep breath, right? Cypress, lemon, orange, and tangerine. All of those are really, really high in monoterpenes. So if you guess any of those, you are correct. And what I want to do, let's take a look now at the gas chromatography output for just one of these. We're going to look at sacred frankincense. And because I want to make this experiential, if you've got any of these monoterpene oils handy and close by, or even if you don't, if you don't have them handy and close by, then, then go get up and, and get some of these. And if you have one close by, then just put it on. I want you to experience and think about how this uh, how the science backs this up, right? I told you that you'll immediately smell it, but then that aroma is gonna pretty quickly go away too. So I'm gonna go with my sacred frankincense because that's what we're gonna look at is the gas chromatography output on the next screen here. But I'm putting on some sacred frankincense, putting a couple drops in my hand, and I'm gonna smell that. And then what I'm gonna do is, as I talk about this, we're gonna smell it again at the end. And I want you to see how you notice the, the aroma of that change from the time when you first put it on and smelled it to a, a minute or two later. 
So this is the gas chromatography output. I'm gonna blow this up for sacred frankincense. And notice that almost all the major heavy notes are down at this monoterpene end, right? There are a few little hints of some oxygen monoterpenes and some a few little notes of sesquiterpenes, right? But overwhelmingly, this, this, this is comprised of monoterpenes in the gas chromatography output. And so this is a really great example of a monoterpene rich oil. And so the major one that you're seeing there, that one single spike that, that goes right through the word monoterpene, that is actually the specific terpene known as alpha pinene. This is a major constituent in sacred frankincense, also a major constituent in a lot of other um, oils that Young Living has. Uh, but also several other constituents are there. They're just not as plentiful and there's not as many of them there. Um, and so, like I said earlier, this GC analysis is like, it's basically like a fingerprint for an essential oil. Um, they may not look exactly like this every time you distill sacred frankincense. The, the quantities may change and shift just a little bit, but you're still going to be able to compare the gas chromatography output for one batch of sacred frankincense with, with the gas chromatography output for another one. And you're going to see remarkable similarities that's going to, would, would allow any trained scientist to know just by showing them this profile, they would immediately be able to say, oh, that's, that is sacred frankincense. I can tell just by looking at that output. So this is what Young Living will use to look for and make sure that, every, that there's no contaminants in it and that it, everything is as it's supposed to be with this. All right, moving on to the next one, we're gonna talk about those oxygenated monoterpenes. So these are those two isoprene units, which put those together and you get that 10 carbon atom molecule plus there are some oxygen atoms added onto that. Oxygen atoms are a little on the heavy side of, uh, in terms of molecular weight. Uh, and so they add a fair amount of weight to that molecule. So this is some subcategories of this. It would be ketones, aldehydes, alcohol, alcohols, and esters are all the subcategories that make up this oxygenated monoterpene category. In terms of the effect of, of an oxygenated monoterpene, tend to think of these as being very therapeutic and healing, very calming. And some people would even describe them as having a, a sedative effect um, as a result of that molecular structure. And so um, what would be some examples of these mid-range, right? So these were our mid-range string instruments, the violins and the violas um, and some of the larger uh, woodwinds and, and smaller brass instruments that make up this mid-range instruments. What do you guys think? Give me some ideas in the chat of what you think would be in the oxygenated monoterpene category. If you're brave enough, even go and get one that you think is an oxygenated monoterpene and get ready to put that on in our next step. All right, oxygenated monoterpenes. Here are some of the big ones. Yeah, Penny said lavender, absolutely. Yeah, lavender is very heavy in oxygenated monoterpenes. Other great ones that are really heavy on the oxygenated monoterpene category would be peppermint, ylang ylang, lemongrass, cinnamon bark, and rose. All of those are really, really heavy uh, oxygenated monoterpenes. And so before we put one of these on, I want you to take a second back up and, and smell that sacred frankincense now, now that a few minutes have passed. What do you notice about the change of it? Do you, does it smell different to you? Because odds are that some of those oxygenated monoterpenes or some of those monoterpenes uh, that you smelled initially have, have completely evaporated away now. And now you're probably smelling more of a blend of the monoterpenes with some of those lighter sesquiterpene and oxygenated monoterpene notes uh, that were much more minor players in that. But you should smell a difference in how it smells now versus how it smelled when you first put it on. All right. Some people will describe it even as saying like at first they smell it very, it smells very light and airy and now it smells a little more woodsy again, because those woodsy smells tend to be more towards that sesquiterpene side. All right, so let's take a look at the, at the chemical uh, makeup of peppermint. So if you've got peppermint on hand, this would be a good time to pick another spot. So I did the last one on inside my palm. I'm gonna put this one on the back of my hand so I can distinguish it from the sacred frankincense that I had earlier. And I'm gonna smell it right out of the gate if I put it on and we're gonna wait a few minutes and compare that to how it smells a little bit later. While we do that, we're gonna look at the gas chromatography output for peppermint. 
So notice there are some monoterpenes and in, in, in some that are actually even a little bit on the heavy side. Uh, it's not quite as singular as the sacred frankincense is, right? It has a, a few more uh, constituents in it. In fact, but the two, certainly the two biggest spikes that we see in this, the most volume of molecules comes from these two spikes in the oxygenated monoterpene category. And this would be menthol and menthone are the name of those specific compounds. Uh, but by far the most abundant in constituents in peppermint are these oxygenated monoterpene categories. And so again, this is something that, uh, this is a fingerprint for peppermint. So good quality peppermint is always gonna have this, this similar molecular structure. If you try to throw spearmint or another similar oil in there, it's gonna have a, a, it, it's gonna have a different uh, distribution on that gas chromatography output. And if we see any impurities or, or contamination, those are all gonna show up on here and it's gonna be a red flag of something that needs to be uh, addressed in terms of that batch of essential oils. So that's what that looks like. Let's move on. We're gonna talk about our sesquiterpenes next while we give that peppermint a few minutes to uh, dissipate and then go back and smell that in a little bit. So the sesquiterpenes, I said that these are our big base instruments in the symphony, right? They're the heavy molecules they tend to not have a really very much of a strong smell at first, but they do tend to last a long time because it takes them much longer to evaporate because of the molecules. The molecules are much larger. Usually when we're describing a sesquiterpene smell, we're describing, we're gonna describe something that's very woodsy or earthy aromas. These are tend to be the much thicker um, viscous oils instead of the lighter, thinner oils um, like the monoterpenes and oxygen monoterpenes. Um, these are often thought to be the wisdom molecules. They're often thought to be the molecules that really interact with our brain and help oxygenate our brain and help uh, transform and, and, and restructure things in our brain in a positive way. So what would be some examples of sesquiterpenes? Again, if you go out on the limb, go get one and then come back and bring it back and find out if you're right on this and see what you think are some good sesquiterpene oils. I would have to say that if I have to pick a favorite category of oil, it's going to be one that's that's high in sesquiterpenes because those are the the just the, the wood woodsy smell is fantastic. All right, so Ken is guessing heliochrysum, and let's see, Penny is guessing vetiver and myrrh. Let's take a look at what I have on these next slides here. All right, cedarwood, uh, vetiver, myrrh, sacred sandalwood. Ginger, all of these are oils that are very, very heavy in um, these sesquiterpenes. I'm not sure about heliochrysum. I think heliochrysum is a blend of oxygenated monoterpenes and sesquiterpenes both. Um, so that's that definitely a good guess because it is definitely a little more on the viscous side. It's a little heavier. Just because I don't have it on my list here doesn't mean it's not a good sesquiterpene example. All right, so if you've got one of these, grab one of those. And before we put that on though, we're going to go back to the peppermint now. So what do you notice about how the peppermint smells now compared to how it smelled initially? Again, most people would describe it as being like really light and airy and florally at first. And now it smells a little more earthy and a little more woodsy because again, you've lost some of those monoterpene notes and you're probably just smelling the oxygen monoterpenes and the sesquiterpenes at this point. All right, so my um, sesquiterpene that I'm going to put on is Royal Hawaiian Sandalwood, very similar to the sacred um, sandalwood that I'm showing there on the screen. If you've not had the opportunity to smell one of the sandalwoods, either sacred sandalwood or Royal Hawaiian Sandalwood, you are missing out because this oil is fantastic. Now, I better start putting it on my skin now because it does take a while for it to get out of the bottle. So if we, by the time I'm done with the presentation, hopefully that one drop has left the bottle and I can move on. There we go. All right, super thick, very viscous. It doesn't just run right into your skin. You have to rub that in to your skin because of all those sesquiterpene molecules. So let's take a look at the profile for sacred sandalwood. So sacred sandalwood, you can see a few little minor notes that over there on the between monoterpenes and oxygenated monoterpenes. But overwhelmingly, we've got this, this vast array of really heavy molecules, right? Lots of tubas and, 
cellos and basses and all the heavy, heavy molecules in sacred sandalwood. That's exactly why sacred sandalwood has this really amazing, deep, rich smell. And why, I don't know if you ever noticed this, if you put sandalwood on now an hour or two or three from now, you're still going to smell it on your skin. Whereas oftentimes we put uh, a lighter one like uh, the peppermint or um, the sacred frankincense, you put that on and really within within 30 minutes or so, it can be difficult to smell anymore. So that's why sacred sandalwood hangs around so long and why it's such a great oil to wear as a perfume or a clone or anything like that. So, all right. Next, a little side note here. So how do we apply this? Let's talk about lavender. Lavender is one that often people refer to as the Swiss army knife of essential oils, right? Like people say, if you only have one oil in your arsenal, make it lavender because lavender is known as the Swiss army knife. It has so many different things that it does, has so many beneficial properties in terms of how it interacts with our body. And it just is good for everything, right? It's good for skin issues. It's good for um, taking internally. It's all kinds of benefits and reasons why we would use lavender. So why is that? What do you think the chemical compound and chemical uh, constituency makeup is of lavender? Well, this is it. This is the first one I actually showed you earlier when I was explaining the different categories. The reason lavender is such a great oil for so many different things is because it has all the constituent categories in it. It's got lots of monoterpenes and lots of oxygen monoterpenes and even lots of sesquiterpenes. So lavender is one of those. This would be a good time to put on some lavender if you have that handy. You put lavender on, and this is one that really changes. The first, you know, at first, you're going to smell those monoterpenes, and then a few minutes later, you're going to start smelling more of the oxygenated monoterpenes. And then, you know, an hour from now, you're going to start smelling more of the sesquiterpenes just because of the way they evaporate at different rates. And that's what creates this beautiful symphony of aroma as, as it, and it changes the longer you have it on, right? So if you've ever wondered why does lavender have so many uses, this is exactly why. It's because it has a lot of different individual constituents that make up this wonderfully diverse oil with so many different applications to it. All right, so put your lavender on and we're moving on to the next step, which is a little did you know. So a lot of people don't realize this, but this whole idea of gas chromatography and analyzing chemicals like this, this isn't something that's only done with these natural essential oil molecules. A lot of companies that manufacture uh, other types of, of personal care products use gas chromatography to figure out what constituents they have in a particular substance. And in order to try and mirror and match what's going on in natural essential oils. So like you might buy you know, a generic muscle rub from the drugstore, and it's going to have some chemical synthetic versions of the same things that are found naturally in plants. So you might have a chemical version of menthol that's, that's heavy in peppermint, and they may try and replicate that in the lab. They're going to say, okay, well, the molecular weight of menthol is this. Therefore, let's see if we can make something in the lab that has a similar molecular weight, and therefore it should have some similar properties, right? And it does, it may have some similar properties and some similar uh, aroma to it, but it won't be the exact same makeup. In fact, sometimes in the lab, they can make it exactly the same, just that the molecule might be shaped like an L facing one way in one uh, in the natural uh, plant, and it's going to be an L facing the other way. And when it's made uh, synthetically in the lab. And, and so it may have a lot of similarities and it may be a lot cheaper to manufacture in the lab rather than to, to extract the natural essential oil uh, the way Young Living does, but it doesn't provide all the same benefit because it's not exactly the same. Even though it may be similar in chemical makeup, it's not exactly the same. So, so many of these commercial products try and match the, ascent, the benefits of the essential oils by using these synthetic versions of the, of the constituents that are found in the plant. But there's nothing like the original natural thing that you get right from an essential oil molecule. All right, so that's that's a lot of the science about how essential oils are classified in the different constituent categories. So now let's talk about how you actually use them and what that what how what the best way to use them. And we this is something we cover in a lot of our really basic one on one classes, right is the three primary uses the aromatic, the topical and the internal are the three ways that you can use an essential oil. So we're, we're going to talk now though about why each of these 
uh, ways to use them or what we call a route of administration, uh, how, how each of these methods actually works and interacts with our body. So let's take a look at the first one, which is to use it aromatically. So this is just what we've done already, right? Is putting a few drops on our skin and then using that as, as a way to diffuse those molecules up to our nose and, and to smell them, right? So that the first category of aromatic is not something that um, that is foreign to us already because we've already done it here in this class. But there's two ways that that oils work in terms of interacting with us aromatically. One is that they they affect our brain in, in terms of our psychology and the way we think, and, and they we're going to get into that in a little bit. But the way of, in terms of breathing an essential oil molecule in, it's also a great way to get those essential oil molecules into our bloodstream. So when you breathe an essential oil molecule in, it's gonna go through uh, your, uh, your wind tube, right? You go through your pharynx and larynx down into your trachea. And from your trachea, it's gonna go down into your lungs, which your lungs basically are like an upside down tree where they branch out into these smaller and smaller branches until you get down to those tiny branches of the bronchiolae and the alveolae. And these alveoli are little tiny sacs that do the, the exchange of, of the oxygen um, with the air and extract the oxygen from the air that we breathe and get that oxygen into our bloodstream. That's how, that's how we function and, and live, right? Is by our alveoli extracting the oxygen from the air and putting that into our bloodstream. But this is these alveoli and the bronchioli are really, really thin membranes because they have to be thin enough to allow the oxygen to pass through and to get into our bloodstream. These really, really thin membranes are a great way to allow the essential oil molecules to also get into our bloodstream because of how thin that membrane is. And there's also a ton of absorption going on there because of the fact that oxygen is being moved into the blood. It's very easy for your body to move those essential oil molecules into the bloodstream as well so that they, they can be circulated throughout your whole body. The other thing that you have going for you when you breathe an oil in and get it down into your lungs, and this again, this can be through a diffuser or just through putting it on your hand, getting those essential oil molecules into vapor form and then into your lungs. Not only are those membranes in the alveoli really small, but they're actually quite massive, right? So if you were to cut open your lungs and take each one of those alveoli and unfold it and, and and lay all those alveoli out on a, on a flat surface, it would actually cover the, a, a regulation tennis court roughly in terms of size. So in terms of the amount of surface area you have in your lungs in order to exchange oxygen and to exchange essential oil molecules with your bloodstream, that is a massive amount of area all contained because it's all in these little tiny folds in all these little tiny alveoli that if you unfold all those, it would be literally the size of a tennis court is how big those are. So it's a great way to get the oils into your bloodstream fast. But as I mentioned, it's not the only benefit to, to having the oils aromatically. The other way is that the, these oils, when we breathe them, they really have a profound impact on our brain. And so that's not going through our lungs, but that's the other way that we breathe them in is when we breathe them and go into our nose then it goes into our olfactory system. The olfactory system is just a fancy word for our sense of smell. And it really, it's one of the least understood senses in our body. There's still a lot of research being done trying to explain how this works because it is the sense that's most closely tied with some of our uh, functions such as memory and emotions. So, the, but the, the key thing here to take away is that the sense of smell is different than all of our other senses in one major way. And that is that all of our other senses are, are processed by a part of our brain called the thalamus. The thalamus is like our switchboard for our brain. And, the, and what it does when we encounter any other sense besides our sense of smell, those senses are relayed to the thalamus. Um, and then from there, it goes to the cerebral cortex, which is our logical part of our brain. So our, from there, our brain can process that sense from a logical perspective, it determines whether a fight or flight response is necessary or if this is just something that needs to be analyzed and understood. But your, your sense of smell doesn't do that. Your olfactory system is the only sense you have that works completely different. It bypasses the thalamus and the logical cerebral cortex and it goes directly to your limbic system of your brain, which is a completely different structure within your brain. So let's take a look at where that is and how that works. So. Your limbic system is 
uh, is a structure in the very center of your brain. And when you breathe in a, a molecule in, it's going to go in through your nose, up into your nasal cavity. And from there, those odorant molecules are going to bind to your olfactory receptor cells in the back of your nose. It's on a piece of skin uh, known as the epithelium. And from those, uh, from there, those receptors are going to trigger an electrical response and send a signal back to the olfactory nerve. And from that olfactory nerve, it's going to go to the olfactory cortex, which is the, the basically the switchboard for the limbic system part of our brain. And so once it's there, let's take a look at a little closer look at the limbic system. The limbic system is basically this combination of structures in the brain. It's located in the very, very center of your brain. So it's really well protected and it's for good reason is because it does, it has a lot of important functions. Um, these structures play a major role in controlling our mood, our memory, our behavior, and emotion. Uh, so just as an example, the amygdala, this is that almond-shaped mass of nuclei. This is what's involved in our emotional responses. It controls our hormone secretions, our memories. It determines what memories are stored based upon what you process, and it determines where in your brain those, those particular memories are stored. Uh, the limbic system is also made up of the hippocampus is another substructure of that. It's, that's a tiny nub that acts as a memory. Um, it, it, it acts as a, uh, the, the hippocampus is a tiny nub. It acts as a memory indexer. There we go. It helps uh, with forming long-term and short-term memories. And then there's the hypothalamus, which directs many important functions such as sleep patterns that wakes you up in the morning. This is what gets adrenaline flowing. Um, this is a really impo important emotional center controlling the molecules that make you feel exhilarated, angry, or happy. And it also regulates your body's temperature and your hormones, your metabolism, all the things that your body does and self-regulates without you having to think about it. All that takes place in the limbic system. And so when you smell an oil, those essential oils go to work immediately in the limbic system affecting each of those really important functions and structures in the limbic system. So that's a little bit about the psychology of how those oils work. Here's just another look at some of these major roles that I mentioned, regulating motions, decision-making, impacting behavior, hormone functions, sleep patterns, our long-term memory, even activating the immune system, regulating blood pressure and regulating our digestion. All those things happen in the limbic system in the your sense of smell is the only sense you have that directly interacts with that particular part of the brain. So this, we've talked about memory and, and how the limbic system is such a key part to memory. And that's why smells have such a power and full impact on our memories, right? Helen Keller is known as saying that a smell is a potent wizard that transports you across thousands of miles in all the years you have lived. Right. And if anybody was in tune with her sense of smell, I'm sure that it was Helen Keller being void of those other senses. She had to rely so heavily on the senses that she had. So I can only imagine that her sense of smell was was hyper uh, in tune with everything that she experienced. And so this whole idea of the, the connection between our smell and our memory is something that's known scientifically as the Proust phenomenon. It's named after the French author Marcel Proust, who wrote a fictional book where he described the basis of that fictional story was this tie between our memory and our sense of smell. But of course, since it, that, even though the book was, was fictional, the, the, the truth behind that is that there is a lot of science to support this idea of the connection between smell and memory. Um, so much so we've all had experiences where you smell something and just instantaneously it transports you back to, uh, to a, a time years and years before where you quickly recognize that smell and it just makes you immediately think of some past memory. And this, that's exactly why it works. If the science is that it's because your olfactory system is just tied directly to that part of the brain that deals with your memory and also deals with your emotions. And so that's why essential oils used aromatically are a great way to support your emotional health. And so Young Living has a whole bunch of oils that all have these emotional names to them. They all tend to be in these purple bottles um, so that they're easy to find, right? And these are what we refer to as the emotional blends. There's actually a whole kit of oils that Young Living has called the feelings kit. It's all targeted at, at helping us support those emotions. And the way it works is that it's because all of our sense of smell is tied directly to that limbic system in our brain where, where we 
uh, process our memories and process all of those emotions. So we've got a whole other class just on that. If that's something that interests you, I encourage you to check that out um, and, and dive into that. And that's a great way to support your emotional health is with some of these emotional blends and with the feelings kit, especially. So with that, let's talk about topical and using the oils in a topical sense and putting them on your skin. So you can use them on your skin by either massaging them into the area or just rubbing your hands together and then putting your hands, uh, rubbing those on your forearms, wherever uh, you put those, uh, those oils are going to go to work on getting into your uh, bloodstream as well. And so let's take a look at how that works, how that, that mechanism works. Um, so first of all, the thing to understand is that most of our skin is, is very permeable. We have lots of pores and those pores allow the essential oils to get into our skin. The essential oils are fat soluble. So that means that all the fat that we have in our skin layer absorbs, very readily absorbs those essential oil molecules and transmits those into our body. Um, but we, it's also important to recognize that we are pretty much have equal pore size throughout our body. So some of our areas that are considered really tough skin, like the bottom of our feet, they still have the same amount of ability to absorb those oils. So in some cases, you want to focus an oil that maybe would be considered a hot oil that might burn a little bit when you put it on, or maybe it's an oil that you don't really like the smell of, then the great way to do that topically is to put them on the bottom of your feet because you don't really feel it and you don't really smell it as much there, but it goes to work just as well in terms of getting absorbed into your body. And this is a little bit about how that absorption mechanism works. As the, as that, as the oil is placed on your skin, it's going to be absorbed into your skin through this three layer system. So the skin is broken down into three layers. There's the top layer, which is what we call the epidermis. And then there's the mid layer, which is the dermis, and then the bottom layer, which is called the hypodermis. And the, derm the epidermis's main responsibility is to be a barrier. It's supposed to be a filter to keep things out that we don't want in. And so that top layer um, of the epidermis is there's a really thin layer in within the top layer of that epidermis um, that's called the stratum corneum. And the way to think of this is it's like a brick wall. There's skin cells that make up this stratum corneum and those skin cells are like the bricks in a brick wall. But on a brick wall, mortar holds those bricks together. But on our skin, that mortar is not impenetrable. That mortar that holds those skin cells together is actually fat. And so the fat holds those different skin cells together. And that fat is a great mechanism to absorb the essential oils into your body. And so this is a really important feature of the skin to remember is that as I talked about, oils are fat soluble. So in order for a molecule to gain access to your bloodstream and travel to your different systems and organs in your body to perform in what it's supposed to do, it must pass through those layers of epidermis followed by the dermis and the hypodermis. And only then does it finally reach the blood vessels before it gets into our circulatory system. So when you put lotion on or an insect repellent or a sunscreen, you put those on your body, where does it go? Does it just sit on top of your skin? Or does it get absorbed into your skin just like the essential oils do? Of course, it gets absorbed. So this is why it's so important to know exactly what you're putting on your skin, right? And to be cautious about the products that you put on your skin because it doesn't just sit there. Even though the stratum corneum is like a brick wall, it's a brick wall with permeable mortar to it, right? The, the, the mortar or the, uh, the fat uh, molecules that hold together those skin cells, it lets... Uh, fat soluble things in very readily. So any kind of lotion or insect repellent that has fat soluble elements to it is going to get quickly absorbed into the skin. And that's going to get absorbed into the bloodstream through those layers of your skin. All right. To wrap up uh, this whole topical use, there are some safety tips. A lot of people are when they're first using oils, they freak out a little bit. They're like, I'm afraid that I'm going to do something wrong. I'm going to put an oil on and I'm going to spontaneously catch on fire and die. That's never happened. At least we have no scientific reporting of that kind of thing happening. You really don't need to worry about any major impacts and side effects from oil. So, but these are just a few little safety tips and take it from somebody who's learned the hard way on a couple of these things. Uh, that they're just best to be a little bit cautious, but not to, not to freak out and panic, right? First of all, always follow the label directions and instructions. If there's if whatever instructions are on there, 
follow those because those are there to help you. But secondly, dilution, right? So carrier oils um, is any kind of fatty oil, like so any kind of vegetable oil, like Young Living has their own proprietary vegetable oil called V6. But you could also use coconut oil or, or uh, almond, seed, almond oil or grapeseed oil um, in those that's a great way to start using oils topically is to dilute them with a little bit of a carrier oil until you see how you respond. Be really careful with sensitive areas and don't put the oils directly into your ears or onto your eyes. That's one of those ones that I had to learn the hard way. Um, and in terms of the water, remember these that essential oil molecules do not dissolve in water. They're not water soluble, they're fat soluble, which means if you try and wash off an essential oil with water, all you're doing is spreading it around your body more and potentially driving that in deeper, right? So be very cautious in terms of using water. If you put too much oil on, just add a carrier oil to it. Don't add water to it to try and rinse it off. And then the last thing is just being aware that some oils, especially citrus oils, can be uh, cause you to be a little bit photosensitive. So if you're somebody that sunburns easily, you might just give some time between when you put a, a, a citrus oil on and when you go out in direct sunlight. All right, so those are the safety tips for topical use. I mentioned in that last one, the whole difference of, uh, of using a carrier oil. What we refer to that in technical terms is this idea of neat versus diluted. So using an oil neat means that you're gonna use it without a carrier oil. Using it diluted means that you're gonna put a carrier oil, uh, mix that in with the essential oil first. So depends on what you're trying to do, why you would use it neat versus diluted. If you're looking for it to make a direct and, and high impact effect, then neat is your way to go. Um, so this is, neat would be a great way to use oils after exercise to place those on your muscles where you want a lot of intense effect. Um, you can also, like I said earlier about using them on your feet, great way to, um, to use oils neat is on your feet because you're not going to smell and or feel them as much as you would in other areas of your body. You also want to use them neat though if you're going for the aroma, like when we're putting them in the palm of our hands just to smell them it's gonna be much more effective aromatically when you're using them neat. You might wanna use them diluted though, if you're using them in, on sensitive skin or for children or when you're starting out, or if it's just an oil that, that, has a, a, that is a particularly hot oil, something like cinnamon that might burn a little bit when you put it on, using a carrier oil, diluting it will help to, to even that feeling out and allow it to absorb into the skin much, much slower than it would if you're applying it neat. All right, and then internally, our last way of using oils, and Young Living has made this really easy to tell which ones are specifically labeled for internal use, and that's because any of the vitality oils that are designed for internal use are going to have the white label on them. So the, the label itself will be white, and that tells you that it's a vitality oil. Now, you can get peppermint. This peppermint is a vitality uh, oil label. You can also get the peppermint in a green label that is not vitality labeled. Is there a difference between the peppermint and the white label versus the green label? Absolutely not. They're exactly the same um, oil. It's just that the FDA requires that Young Living label an oil as either topical use or internal use. They can't be one product can't be labeled for both. So all they do is put them in different bottles so that now they have different SKU numbers. So they label this one for internal use and that one for topical but they're all the same thing. So let's talk very quickly about how, when you take an oil internally, what happens to it? We all know a little bit about our digestive system that we swallow something and it goes into the stomach. What happens from there though? What, what actually happens uh, in terms of the, of the oil making its way through our digestive pathway? So as we know, that food that we eat, that oil that we ingest internally is gonna get into our stomach. And from here, that food or liquid is going to mix with all those gastric juices in our stomach and, and it's going to start breaking down that food and oil both chemically as well as physically um, and the food then that that sits in the stomach for a while being broken down is then squeezed into the first part of the small intestine and as it passes through the lower small intestine all the nutrients are actually absorbed through the food this is also a great place for the essential oils uh, that make it through the stomach to also get absorbed and, and assimilated into the body through the lining of the small intestine. So the intestinal wall is lined with all these millions of finger-like projections called villi. And each of these, uh, the singular would be villus, 
is connected to a mesh of capillaries. And it's, this is how those nutrients pass into the bloodstream. So this is another example, similar to the alveoli, where you have this massive uh, surface area for the oils to interact with and get absorbed into the body. It's the same way with the small intestine. The small intestine on average is around 30 feet in length. And so when you think about the, the, uh, the amount of area that you have for those oils to get absorbed, it's quite large when you take those internally. Um, and so when you take a Vitality oil internally, this is a really great way to support your internal body systems, your digestive system. And it's a great place to do that because of that large absorption area. And also it takes a long time for your digestive system to move that through. And so it has this long contact time with your digestive system as well. And I mentioned how sometimes you might have some breakdown of that essential oil in the stomach and that not all of it may get to the small intestine. Well, that's a great reason to use uh, a vegetable capsule in when you're taking your oil. So if you put the oil inside a vegetable capsule, what that's gonna do is it's gonna protect the oil in that capsule while it's in your stomach and hopefully get it so that it passes, that, is, that more of it will actually make it to your small intestine where it can be readily absorbed into your body. Now, if you're taking something like uh, say digide because you want more of an effect in your stomach, then sometimes it is good to take it in a glass of water and take it in a way that where you're gonna get the, if, the oil delivered to your stomach. But if you're going for more impact on your digestive system, the small intestine, and looking for the maximum absorption, then using a, a vegetable capsule uh, to protect the oil while it's in the while it sits in the stomach is going to be your best bet. All right, so some good takeaways. What are some great vitality oils to start with in terms of supporting your digestive system? These are three of the best ones that I like to recommend for people right out of the gate if they haven't tried using oils internally would be the Digize Vitality, Thieves Vitality, and Grapefruit. So talk, I've already mentioned Digize. Digize is this amazing blend that's formulated specifically for a digestive system. So this is great to put a few drops in a glass of water and drink that before a large meal. You're always better off to do it before the meal rather than doing it, uh, trying to catch up with it after the meal. So take it before the meal or put the Digize in capsules. Um, and then the Thieves is a great way to support your immune system. And the Thieves blend includes lemon, cinnamon, rosemary, clove, and eucalyptus radiata, which are all oils that have been shown to really have a strong effect in terms of supporting your immune system. And then last but not least, that grapefruit vitality has actually been known for a long time that grapefruit provides amazing benefits for weight management. So a lot of people uh, have gone on diets of eating lots and lots and lots of grapefruit, right? Because of its a, a ability to help our body maintain a natural healthy weight. And so grapefruit vitality oil is a great way to do that without having to go through the tedious work of cutting open the grapefruit and that, you know, cutting it up into the little tiny pieces that you can actually eat. So super easy way. These are great three practical ways to start using vitality oils right away in your routine. So that's it. I hope that no matter, like I said earlier, when I began, no matter where you started from and the skeptic or the curious or the know-it-all, I hope that you got something out of this and that you're benefiting from uh, this information. But I hope most of all that you're going to take some of this information and put it into practice. You're going to start being more conscious about the oils that you put on and thinking, hmm, what am I smelling here? Is this a monoterpene, a sesquiterpene, or is it an oxygen monoterpene? and start thinking about some of those things and then start using some of the resources to look up and do your own research and dig in more um, and just make better, more uh, conscious decisions about your health by understanding how and why the oils work the way they do to support us at the digestive level and at the emotional level um, and to support our lungs and our skin and all the ways that we talked about using essential oils. So. With that, I'm gonna open it up to a few questions. I have not been paying attention to the chat, so Jody's gonna to have to help me out here and moderate some questions and wrap it up. I sent you a direct message. Okay. This is the part where you so Aaron wants to know, does any oxidation occur during the steam distillation process? 
I answered her the best that I could, but I didn't know if you had anything else to add. So it is possible that you can get some oxidation. This is where Young Living has been doing this for such a long time, right? They've been in business for like 26, 27 years now. And Gary was distilling oils for years before he started the company. And so it really comes down to making sure that you're using the right temperature and pressure, right? They have the ability to, to regulate both the temperature and the pressure of those distillers. And so if you're not doing it for the right amount of time or at the right pressure or at the right temperature, then yes, you can, you can damage the oils with, in, by causing oxidation. But um, if you're using the right practices and then testing it on the, on the backside of it with those gas chromatography to make sure that you're not getting any of the wrong constituents in there. Um, that's, that's the solution to that. It's absolutely possible. That's why you got to be really careful with the, with the temperature and pressure and uh, duration of the distillation process. And the other question was from Diana, what's the best answer to tell someone the main difference between Young Living oils and the oils people buy from the health food store? Yeah, a couple things. One is the, the amount of testing. Young Living does uh, so much more testing and has so much more science to back up what they do uh, in terms of the guaranteeing the quality of the oil. So many other suppliers just distill it. They don't, they can't afford, they possibly afford these gas chromatography machines, which are extremely expensive. And so they just bottle and just, they just bottle whatever comes out of the distiller without any regard for it having contaminants or anything else in it. And so Young Living's testing standards go just far beyond anybody else out there. And they do that because they also go far beyond anybody else's standards in terms of how it's grown and cultivated. They don't use any chemical uh, fertilizers when they're growing the crops. They don't use any chemical pesticides. They use all natural treatments to make sure that there's absolutely no chance of contamination of that oil. And so that's the biggest difference is that Young Living goes to uh, just far beyond in terms of making sure that it has the ultimate purity and they do that on the front end with making sure that, that they're not putting anything chemical on the plants and they do it on the back end by testing it to verify that there are in fact no contaminants in it. That's the biggest difference between Young Living and all the other companies out there. And then would you share with, um, how you can travel with oils? I know you've traveled overseas even, but how to travel with oils when traveling by air and then maybe share with someone if they're not yet a member yet, how they can get started. Right. So traveling, well, traveling with oils is easy. I just bring along what I use. And if you, in terms of if you're, if you're traveling with them on airplane, it's just like anything else. You, you put them in your Ziploc bag uh, in, in terms of getting through security. If you're going to carry them on, if you're going to check them, you can really put them in anything, right? They'll, and they will do just fine. They're not temperature sensitive in terms of the cold that you, you that would ex be experienced in the cargo hold of the plane. But all the oils that you're used to using at home, I think are a great idea for taking with you on the go. We have a whole video on that I did a few months ago on traveling with oils and ideas for traveling with them and making sure you're getting, uh, using, using all the oils um, that you would need when you're traveling. So I guess I would refer you to that. We, we should include that link in the email and we send that out in terms of referring back to that previous travel one. And then in terms of where you go from here, if you're not a Young Living member, the best thing you can do is become a Young Living member in order to enjoy the products. I know you can buy them off of another distributor, but the problem is that you don't get the maximum benefit. First of all, you're putting your, your health and wellness decisions in somebody else's hands, right? Saying, hey, will you do this for me? And rather than you taking ownership of it for yourself, and so what we always encourage people to do is get your own Young Living membership. It's super easy to do. Um, and that way you don't have to bug your friend to place an order for you and to, um, and for them then to get it delivered to their house. And then you got to meet up and get the oil from them. 
The other part of that is that if you're not ordering yourself as a member, you're missing out on all the freebies that Young Living gives you for being a member. Every, every member, when you order, uh, there are all kinds of rewards and loyalty gifts that go along with, with being a member. So you're always best off to have your own membership. And if you don't have a membership, the easiest thing to do is to go back to the friend who invited you to this class tonight and say, hey, I am ready to get started. Help me figure out how to join Young Living so that I can start getting uh, all the benefits of the products that we're talked about tonight. And so you'll go back to them and they'll walk you through how you can log into the Young Living website and input their member number into uh, as a referral number. And then that will allow you to be kind of, to become a member of Young Living. There are some great kits that you can start with or you can build your own custom kit. And again, uh, you can reach out to us if you need help with that or reach out to the person that invited you to the call tonight and they can walk you through all the details about what kit might be best for you or whether you might want to customize your own kit. And then you'll start getting all the benefits of that Young Living membership. Anything else, Joan? All right. Well, thank you guys for joining us tonight and thanks for being part of this. We are going to have, we have these classes every single Monday night. Um, so just check back and register for a subsequent week's class. And we would love to see you bring some friends along with you too. I think Jody posted the link maybe somewhere in there. Yeah. Um, so grab that link and send that to some friends and invite them to come back and join us for next week's class. And we will see you all then. Thanks everybody.